What's the trade after NVIDIA? Do you have one? Yeah, yeah, you're putting me on the spot, and I'm not. I'm not a great tech investor, uh, so. But I you're just shorter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would. I would just say that. Look, w the one thing that I see from the macro perspective is everyone thinks commercial real estate, you know, is in in the tank, and it's really, really just focused in the office market. When you look at the data center market, um, it is white hot. Uh, people that are developing data centers don't even get them developed before one of the fangs leases it uh, for 30 years. So uh, uh, I have a friend that has, you know, 13 data centers that they were developing all over the country. And in one phone call, you know, did a $3 billion, you know, multi-decade deal with one of the fangs. They just leased the whole the whole portfolio. So I, data centers are white hot. NVIDIA is white hot. And as you know, we're building, the TSMC is building both a five nanometer Wave for fab and a three nanometer fab in Phoenix. We've got Samsung building in Texas. We've got Intel building in Texas. The U.S. is reshoring, onshoring this high-powered uh, uh, chip business, and Nvidia is leading the way. You know, first with their GPUs and their gaming chips, and now their generative AI stuff that is just uh, again white hot. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't short uh, Nvidia. Uh, I think it just has has a long way to run here. When you talk about a long way to run, how, how should we be thinking about this? Is this a generational shift that we're, that we're experiencing here, Kyle? In 2000, we had to have a massive clear out before we figured out who was going to actually be top dog on the internet. Turned out to be Amazon and companies like that. Are we going to have to see something similar here? We're going to get a lot of people coming at this from different angles. How do we clear out and figure out who's going to be the winner, who's going to be the loser? Yeah, again, I, I look at this from a different perspective, especially on the losing side. I keep reading everything from Wall Street telling me that that AI and generative AI is going to be jobs positive. Mm -hmm. I have a, I just have an impossible time believing that. We've got 3 million plus, let's say, service workers that run cash registers or front ends of businesses in the U.S. We've got 3.5 million truck drivers. I can, I can look through the businesses that I'm fairly certain we're going to see millions of job losses in. And I don't think you can train those specific people or retrain them into, let's say, the high tech market. Uh, so I'm, I'm worried about the long term job possibilities. I mean, just think about mm -hmm. how many how many pilots are out there and, and and really how many pilots are we going to need when we get real? Uh, let's just say what right now. The, the big planes essentially fly themselves. Uh, so we don't need the big crews that we've got. Anyway, I think about the how many jobs are going to be put out of business as, as this so Kyle, gets. So, so, so to that point, so you're thinking, OK, AI is this huge trend. It is a structural shift. It's going to have a big implications for the job market, the economy, and productivity. Are, do you play that? Do you trade it? Is this like, do, like you mentioned, you go by data centers? Like, how do you capitalize on, on this sort of evolving trend? Yeah, I mean, uh, developing data centers, owning uh, public data centers, secure uh, stocks, securities. I mean, that again, that has uh, 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 given ChatGPT and the amount of, of compute that's taking on the back end. I hear that Microsoft and, and Amazon and the rest of the cloud providers are struggling desperately to keep up with the amount of compute that's going on uh, with ChatGPT. And, and again, that's only going to grow exponentially as AI. Uh, get stronger again. You're asking me tech questions. I honestly am, am okay. not tech savvy. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I can't add value there. Okay. Let me let me kind of create a Venn diagram where you may be able to add some value. Kyle, how much of a competitive advantage does Nvidia give America? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it gives gives it a, a huge competitive advantage. And you know, look if you look at if you look at the chips market writ large. You've got TSMC and ASML are 90% of the most advanced chips in the world. You've got in, NVIDIA uh, now blazing the, the, the trail in, in, in AI and generative AI. Uh, it gives us a huge, huge advantage uh, going forward. And, and again, we need to be thinking about uh, these advantages, and not just the US, as you know, Guy, you're in, the, you're in the UK. The US and our allies, let's say the rules-based order in the West, uh, are starting to really think about how we can, you know, China calls it containment. What we call it is uh, uh, defending our own national borders, our national security mm -hmm. from from malign actors. And uh, I think, believe it or not, behind the scenes, we're working hard 
on call it reforming the quad and dealing, really getting close with our allies on, on this strategy going forward. I, I know, Kyle, and I know you've sent um, a letter to the president uh, talking about how you really want to protect uh, U.S. interests, uh, particularly from China, et cetera. Um, how do you invest there, though? Like, how, is it a, do you need to short something in China to then capitalize on that? Like, what's, what's the strategy for you? Well, the, the thing that I could do to help listeners of, of Bloomberg TV and Bloomberg is to tell you, get out of China sell every single public security you have, every single private investment you have. There is no more risk reward that's positive. If you're a fiduciary, if you're a fiduciary of your family, or if you're an ERISA fiduciary, that you have no business investing in a country where you have, now you have no data. You used to have low fidelity data. The, the Chinese government cut off all macro yep. level, level data. You've got no audits, uh, no PCOB covered audits. You have Xi Jinping risk. You've got potential now, Chinese uh, risk of invading Taiwan. And what upside do you have Kyle, from here? I, I just think you've got, it, you've got to basically sell China. The, 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 the upside from China was this idea that China was going to come out of lockdown. It was going to produce a lot of growth. And that growth was going to be a counterweight to a slowing Europe and a slowing United States. Hmm. Do you, that doesn't look like it is showing up in whatever data we have right now. What is the read across from a China that is not going to deliver economically for the economies of Europe and the United States? Right. Uh, look, you, you even see, you don't see the China resurgence. If you look at demand for global commodities, uh, again, you can look across the board, whether you're looking at copper, you're looking at oil, you're looking at everything that China buys on a daily basis hasn't budged. And if you look at their numbers from 2022, uh, you know, their, their LNG uh, uh, demand dropped 22 percent. Their payments across their payment systems were down 31 percent. Mm -hmm. You know, if you guys buy that China grew its GDP when they were when they were uh, welding their citizens into their buildings, you know, I have, I have, a, I have a bridge to sell you. Uh, so I, I think that I don't think China grew their GDP last year. And I think the concentric circles of their real estate markets are what's what's hampering them uh, going forward. And, and again, we need to be thinking about how this world's bifurcating and focus on yeah. what we do best, which is, which is adapting. We will adapt to these problems very quickly. It's not the end of the world, like people uh, say it is. Uh, and, and we are innovative, we meaning the West, yeah. uh, and we, we will get together and we will innovate, we will adapt. Um, so Kyle, something that is maybe hampering uh, any adaptation is the debt ceiling. Are, do you have a debt ceiling trade on right now? Um, I don't have a debt ceiling trade on other than I'm not short the markets, uh, meaning you know, if you just look at the theater that's going on, McCarthy has his his goal has been to own the airwaves, and he's owned the airwaves. His risk has been, uh, you know, playing to the the Freedom Caucus and the the crazies on the right. Uh, and and I actually think he's kind of been threading the needle properly. M McCarthy and Biden, anything can happen when they meet. They're going to meet more often, and there are adults in the room, even though they're they're young staffers in the White House that think they can. They can uh, run this negotiation. I hope there are adults in the room that understand the depth yeah. and the implications of doing something as stupid as defaulting. Okay, let's assume that they don't default, but they do agree some sort of a spending cuts, hiatus, whatever it's going to look like, Kyle. What is the impact of that going to be on the U.S. economy? Are we going to see a slowdown resulting from what is being negotiated right now? No, I mean, that, I think the only thing you'll see out of this is a one to one and a half percent spending cut. On, on general government expenditures. You got I mean, it, 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 we, we are gonna spend, um, on four trillion of revenues, I think we're gonna spend about 5.6 trillion. We're talking about a 6% of GDP deficit. Uh, you know, what you're gonna see some sort of nominal headline grabbing number that, as you'll notice, when the defense appropriation people get involved with the left, they'll, they'll, they'll just, they'll run it over the next time they negotiate. So I, this yeah. is all theater, this is all theater, guys. Alex, if that's the case, then the Fed would appear to have more work to do. Yep. If the US economy is not going to slow down, you look at today's data, you look at the claims data, you look at the GDP numbers we've just had, you look at all of the data that are coming towards us at the moment, it speaks to a very robust economy. If the government's not going to slow it down, presumably the Fed will continue to have to. Yeah, Kyle, we're seeing uh, the uh, swaps market now priced in another um, 25 basis point hike through July. What do you think the Fed's going to do? How do you trade it? I mean, look, uh, there are a couple of answers there. I think uh, if you look at the numbers, you look at credit card delinquencies and you look at uh, the spending proclivities of each of the different socioeconomic strata in the U.S., 
it's it's dropping pretty fast on the expectation numbers. We saw the Foot Locker miss, so let's just say the lower end of the socioeconomic strata has has received all their pass through payments, and you're starting to see businesses suffer a little bit on the low end. On the high end, the excess we'll call it that excess savings that the Fed talks about being a trillion dollars that still has left to be spent. That trillion dollars is in rich people's hands, and it's not going to get spent yep. anytime soon en masse. So. I think you're going to see the impact of 500 basis points of hikes uh, hit hit our economy in, in the back at half of this year. And then you think about the political economy, we're going to have a slowing economy. Yep. We'll have a slowing economy in the back half of this year. I think that's a given if you look at the at the forward numbers. Uh, and then as we go into 24 in an election year, I think you're going to see the Fed uh, aggressively cutting. So your suggestion would be no more hikes from here. How quickly do you think the Fed should cut. The market's just priced out the cuts for this year. You're suggesting that is a mistake. Yeah, I mean, look at, we we paid, the United States government paid in 2020 about $500 billion of interest uh, on our debt. We are going to pay close to, if not over, a trillion this year. Two years later, we're doubling the interest we're paying on the debt. And that's largely due to the fact that we've raised the front end, you know, 500 basis points. You can't keep rates at zero for, for over a decade and then move them 500 basis points and think you're not going to break anything. It just takes time. You've even seen some of the Fed governors refer to we're going to be more data dependent going forward. We're going to see how much uh, our, our hikes affect the economy going forward. So I, again, I don't know whether they hike another 25 or not. I, I, I really don't think that matters. What matters is how fast our economy slows down in the back half of this year. Hey, Kyle, before we let you go, um, I just wanted to turn your attention to whistleblowers and sort of any advice you may have for them. Clearly, the SEC reversed itself on uh, denying you whistleblower award. You were able to fight back. For the regular Joe, what's your advice to them? Well, I tell you what, you know, the SEC is supposed to have a whistleblower program in place uh, to help to have the kind of the market participants, comp corporate, uh, 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 let's say the lower in the corporate side, turn turn fraud in. Um, you know, I turned a fraud in uh, where one of my analysts found a Ponzi scheme, um, and the SEC actually just dropped completely dropped the ball. They they gave a non center settlement with the management team, i.e., meaning leaving management in place. They brought fraud charges in a in a Wells letter, and the company settled. And the SEC settled with this company without even having a set of audited financials in place, and they left management in place. Then the DOJ and the FBI came yep. in and put these people in jail for a collective 20 years on 40 felony counts. The SEC blew it. Now, I realize the SEC doesn't get everything right, but then they, they, denied, they denied our award when we gave them a, an 80-page PowerPoint that was connecting all the dots for them. Kyle. The SEC's got to do a better job with whistleblowers.